Should you kick people out of your ministry and should you public rebuke your members? Your ministry, and I'm also going to discuss public rebukes. Um, I think this is a topic that is well overdue. Um, and I also come with receipts. I never just speak out of term because any directive that I get comes straight from the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to um, explain to you in great detail what Apostle Paul instructed the church to do. Um, so let's take a dive into this. This is 1 Corinthians, and this is chapter 5, and I just want to read up at the top. It says, sexual immorality defiles the church. It is actually reported that there is a sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. So not only did this man uh, take someone's father's um, wife, right? He was also very arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For thou absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So we are not to judge the world, but we are most certainly supposed to judge the people in the church. All right. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is Apostle Paul saying in verse 6, 7, and 8? He is basically saying that a little bit of sin can defile an entire temple. So not only is it necessary for your pastor to call for repentance, but when your pastor keeps getting revelation from God, if he's actually called, because he has to first be called in order to hear from God. The second thing is that your pastor is supposed to publicly rebuke people when they do not come forth and when they do not repent to God in secret. Because you don't even have to go to the pastor, but you need to repent and purge and cleanse of all unrighteousness. And so what you are saying, so let me speak from a leadership standpoint. If you are a leader and you stand in a pool pit and as soon as you get in the pool pit, God starts flooding you and telling you, oh, this person is committing adultery. This person is this. This person is this. This person is this. And you don't correct them. Let me tell you what you said. Number one, you compromised your entire, entire congregation. Number two, you have basically spat in God's face and you said, you know what, God, I hear you, but I'm not telling these people this because I need to get that tithe so I can pay my car note on Friday. That's what you're telling them. You know what, God, I hear what you're saying, but I don't feel comfortable telling them about a sin that I know they're committing because you revealed it to me multiple times and even gave me dreams. So God is saying, you know what, son or daughter, because you refuse to be bold and on fire for God and give them what thus saith to Lord, I'm going to defile your temple and I'm going to take my power out of here in Jesus name. That is what you're saying. And you are basically saying, God, go on right ahead diminish your power because i don't want it because i don't want to publicly rebuke anybody let's read first timothy 5 and 20 but those elders who are sinning you are to reproof before everyone so that the others may take warning first timothy 5 and 20 i'm going to read this in the living translation if he has already sinned then he should be rebuked in front of the whole church so that no one else will follow his example James 5 and 16, admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Let's go back to the very first sentence. It said, admit your faults to one another. Admit your faults to one another and pray for each other. When I, when God gives me revelation concerning things that they need to repent for, I pray for them immediately to edify their spirit. 
to build them up because God can flow freely when you don't have all these open doors. The enemy has access to you. This is why pastors that are extremely overweight, they lose their power in the spirit realm because the, de the demons go to God and they say, God, why would you place this man in power when this man can't even control himself at the dinner table? God has to honor that, okay? Because at the end of the day, if you can't be ruler over your dinner plate, surely you can't be ruler over people's soul, duh. It's a no-brainer. Anybody that comes for me and says that what I'm doing is not biblically sound, it is extremely dangerous to do so. Um, one thing that I found, many people that come to my membership and um, leadership, whatever, my ministry, however you want to call it, 97% um, of them always usually have a spirit of divination that's been imparted into them as a result of the false teachings that they've heard. So when they come around me, I make them very uncomfortable because not only am I calling out all these sins, I'm calling out deep, dark sins. I'm talking deep. I'm talking to the point where it's almost cringy. OK, and so I want you to understand that it, my church is an acts like church. That's what I am building. I'm not don't ever compare me to these illegitimate places that you go to fellowship and actually lose power. Don't ever compare me. That is your biggest, biggest mistake and your biggest downfall is comparing what God is doing through me um, and comparing me to somebody that you deem is more worthy than I, which is totally fine. Um, but you definitely will have to depart from me. But I wanted to pull up these Bible verse to give you all an understanding of what this actually means. Yes, I'm going to give you another Bible verse that is very, very powerful. And it's in 1 Corinthians. It says, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. It does. Evil communication corrupts good manners. This also goes in line with when I tell people to consecrate. Because when you consecrate, you should be consecrating from evil communications, even your toxic family members. 1 Corinthians 5 and 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunken, or an extortioner, with such and one, no, not to eat. Apostle Paul, like, look, you shouldn't even be eating at the dinner table with people like this that is calling themselves a brother and sister in Christ. If you go to a church and you get dreams and stuff about people, your church should have a protocol where you should have access to speak to the pastor. And you should be able to go to the pastor and say, pastor, I had a dream about this person and this is what God revealed to me. And that pastor, if he's led by God, he's going to take what you said back to God. And then that pastor should be rebuking that person. This is the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. This is why if many of you went to an acts like church and you really were under sound doctrine, you would actually fall in line or you would get up out of there. This is why, baby, I kick people out immediately because when I rebuke you multiple times and I see that you don't want to change, I have nothing to do with you because you're basically saying, baby, listen, I don't care what you say or God. I am not going to change for anybody. If you don't listen to God, I don't stand a chance. So therefore, no, you cannot stay around me. In Jesus name. I wanted to post all of these Bible verse to give you revelation on how your church should flow in Jesus name.